on behalf of Mr. Sivy, the applicant who sits behind me, my learned friend, Mr. Stables, is for Miss Riley. Yes. Um, my Lord, the timings were set out in a note. Which yes, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you for sorting that out. That's, that seems um, quite appropriate. Um, my Lord, in, in terms of the first ground, the challenge concerning um, Section 4.2 of the Defamation Act 2013, and, and what we say is the failure of the judge to have regard to all of the circumstances of the case, my Lord would have seen the there is a legal point that Mr. Stables takes in his respondent's statement along the lines of the re-sprint room test to do with challenges against findings of fact. And by way of introduction, what, what I say about that, my Lord, is, is two things. Firstly, what we are concerned with here is not a, an orthodox challenge against factual findings and whether or not the cogency of the judgment is affected because of any um, failure to take account of material factor, et cetera, that might be an issue. What we say is that this is a more fundamental challenge to do with application of the statute. And in respect of that, um, I rely upon the judgment of the Court of Appeal in uh, Economu and what was said by Lady Justice Sharp at paragraph 110, and in particular that as with Reynolds factors, uh, with emphasis on practicality and flexibility, all will depend on the facts. That, that's the end of paragraph 110. The point being, my Lord, the facts have to be considered by the court um, in order for the section to be applied. And I further rely on what was said by Lord Wilson in Seraphin in the Supreme Court, at paragraph 65, by reference to the passage of the 2013 Act and the discussion there of Lord McNally's very speeches in Hansard and the point that's made by Lord Wilson at paragraph 65, as my Lord will be readily aware, um, in discussing how it was that 4-2 came to be part of the public interest defence, to quote, he suggested that's Lord McNally that the proposed subclause, albeit not strictly necessary, would send a signal to the courts and practitioners to make clear the wish of Parliament that the new defence should be applied in as flexible a way as possible <coughs> in terms of the circumstances. Again, my point being, my Lord, that there has to be consideration of relevant facts in order for that um, consideration to be taken into account. If I'm wrong on that, nonetheless, I say that applying the standard re-sprint room test, this is a case in which there's an identical flaw in the judge's treatment of the question to be decided because of those factors which were omitted from consideration and because of those errors which we say were made in respect of those matters that were taken into account. So that, that's the, the legal challenge, if yeah. you like, underpinning ground one. In terms of the facts that we take issue with, my Lord would have seen that the first matter concerns how um, Twitter works, and I, my Lord will be readily familiar with the appendix to Munro and Hopkins, which we rely on in terms of... Well, yes, but it's not an authority. Uh, it, it, it's it's a, an agreed summary of how Twitter worked at the time, Yes, which was an annex to the judgment because the parties hadn't got any evidence on it. Yes, um, well... I mean, you, you point fairly to your client's own witness statement. Yes. Uh, which is your second uh, and that, that's the, these basis points, for this point. Very well. <clears throat> well if, if we put Munro to one side, my Lord, the, the point my Lord touches on is that there was no challenge against what Mr. Sivy has said. Firstly, in terms of circumventing the block um, and the continued surveillance of Rose's account after the 18th of December. 2018, and secondly, in respect of um, Miss Riley being cited as to all of the tweets which Miss Oberman had sent to Rose, um, latterly, and the fact that there was no challenge to the evidence on orthodox principles should have been the end of the matter. Um, what is said against me by Mr. Uh, Stables in his recent submission of the 19th of January. Um, 
and to quote is paragraph three. It says, Deep assists with the argument because the claimant was able to post screenshots of Rose's tweets in her 9th of January thread that rebutted the false allegation of her bullying Rose. This must mean that C was monitoring Rose. This is developed into an argument of stalking in the skeleton argument. Just pausing for a moment, it, it's been the argument that this constituted stalking uh, right from the inception of these proceedings. And in fact, it was reported as such by onlookers at the time. And uh, Mr. Stables says this is so contrived as to be absurd. Well, um, it, in respect of that, my Lord, I, I have a number of points uh, regarding permission. We see from paragraph 71 and 72 of the judgment that both Rose herself and onlookers um, referred to this uh, obtaining screenshots post block as constituting stalking. That was the language that was used. And more importantly, for the purposes of today's exercise, um, what my learned friend goes on to say, his paragraph four, is as follows. Uh, assuming that Rose did block the claimant on Twitter, well, it, it isn't an assumption for the purpose of this exercise because the claimant said as much herself uh, in tweet 219, uh, and there was no evidence to the contrary. Uh, my learned friend continues, Rose's public tweets could have been seen by the claimant by them having been sent to her or merely by logging out of her Twitter account reading public tweets cannot conceivably be described as monitoring, let alone stalking. Well, the first point to make there is that um, it, it, we do not agree that continuing to uh, view these tweets could amount to monitoring or stalking. But, but even if we're wrong on that, Mr. Sivia's point, and the point he emphasized uh, at every stage of his case, was that it wasn't the mere fact that Miss Riley continued to view these tweets, and it seems to be suggested here that it might have been done by one of, in one of the ways which he suggested. It was the fact that she then assembled those tweets, having collated them, she republished them to over 600,000 followers, and she did it with the express purpose of implicating the child who previously she had been in Twitter exchanges with in, as she termed it, the spread of anti-Semitism. Uh, and in doing that, as we'll go on to see, she also juxtaposed those tweets uh, with reports of um, far more uh, sinister events. So it, it's not simply the fact that she is publicly viewing tweets, which previously she has had access to. It's what she seeks to do with them and the ends to which she seeks to um, deploy those tweets in the period from the 18th of December. Um, and of course, she knew the risk that this could cause to the child because she knew the fact that the child had been subject to dog piles following the Twitter threads uh, on the first and second occasions. So, so that's what Mr. Sivy has said in terms of his reasonable belief concerning harassment. Uh, and the, the last point I'd make on this is that the we, the applicant, there is an objection in principle, which is this, um, my lord, it, it doesn't sit in my submission with the respondent latterly in this document received on the 19th of January for the first time to posit some sort of case to do with surveillance monitoring, when at every stage of these proceedings from pre-action correspondence, she has remained steadfastly silent as to how it was that she obtained these tweets and continued to publish them in the period after That's the That's a point I don't really understand. Um, you'll have to explain it to me. The reasonableness of Mr. Sivio's belief has to be tested at the time that he published. Correct. Um, uh, uh, accepting that that was a continuing process. Um, I, I'm not able to see at the moment how anything that the claimant might have said or not said in evidence at the trial in 2022 could have had a bearing on what Mr. Sivio reasonably believed to be the position yes. when he published in 2019 or 2020 or 2021. Yes, uh, as, as a matter of um, legal analysis, I, I, I don't disagree with that, my lord. The, the point I make, um, really, for the purpose of the appeal is this, uh, and it goes back to the point that we touched on before, that the judge arrived at this finding to do with um, not uh, monitoring, but still being able to 
uh, access to tweets without there having been any testing of Mr. Sibia's evidence, and it hadn't been suggested, for instance, by the judge to Mr. Sibia, well, you might be mistaken because perhaps this is the way that Miss Riley obtained these tweets and then republished them. So there is a point here to do with the fairness in that the points taken against him in the judgment not having been raised at any stage during the proceedings and there having been no explanation um, on behalf of Miss Riley before uh, last week, which as I've explained is incomplete. Uh, and the same goes, my Lord, in respect of um, the second issue where we say there was a, a, an error to do with the operation of Twitter and that's the uh, access to and visibility of Miss Oberman's tweets. Um, the, the point again, there was no challenge to this. It didn't form any part of any disputed evidence in the hearing. So to the extent that the point is now taken as it seems to be in the judgment against Mr. Sibia, that should fairly have been raised with him. Sorry, which, which point is that? That's to do with the paragraph 159, the point yeah. that the judge raises there, um, where she says uh, Mr. Sibia did not consider how few of those tweets were replies or tagged Miss Riley. Uh, yes. the, point, the point being she could have seen them without them being replies or without her being tagged into them. And in fact, for reasons I'll come on to deal with because I developed this point uh, in due course, we, we know that uh, Miss Riley did see those tweets that she wasn't, um, that weren't reply tweets or she was tagged into. Um, so that, that's, that's um, A of ground one to do with how Twitter works, my Lord. Um, I then deal with a series of what we say are material omissions and errors. The first to do with research uh, and the um, the first matter here, my Lord, as you would have seen from my written submission, is that contrary to how the judgment reads, there was no dispute that Mr. Sivia had written an article before Mr. Lawson about Miss Riley uh, on the 10th of January and that within that article he had uh, accused her of bullying Rose he had also uh, accused her of having called, caused a dog pile on Rose, and he had uh, called into question her record on anti-Semitism, all matters that were part of the article that um, Miss Riley sued upon. And I should add, my Lord, that within that article there was reference to tweets which Mr. Sivia did not rely on for the purpose of his Section 4 defence in defending the 26th of January article. The point being, he'd obviously read these and independently formed a view before he'd even seen Mr. Lawson's two articles. So in and of itself, that, that oversight on the part of the judge in my submission is fatal to what is said to be the lack of research which he had done. Um, contrary to how paragraphs 146 and 154 one read this was a publisher an author who had already written about the subject matter because he was interested in it um, so that that error um, is material well, her finding was that he wasn't intending to write an article at the time um, I don't think she said he hadn't written about her before did she well, that was, as you say I thought that was part of the undisputed background it, um, check whether she actually was it, it, it was. Well, the, there was no dispute that he'd written an article previously. When one reads the judge's dismissal of what my <coughs> client said about his research, the tweets he'd read the amount of time, there is no reference, my lord. Um, it, it's paragraphs 146 and 154. There's no reference to that previous article. It's not, not even clear. Um, there is a, a passing reference to previous publications, plural, um, within the consideration of serious harm. But in my submission, what should have been at the start of the judge's consideration to do with research is that this was an author who, quite separate from anything Mr. Lawson had said, um, had already written about the subject matter of his article on the 26th of January. H had the judge thought about that uh, and 
um, taken it into consideration, then, then the starting point would have been rather different from the one that we have in the judgment, which is to suggest that Mr. Sivery is someone who, although he did read the Lawson articles, and although the judge accepts that he clicked through to the hyperlinks, she doesn't accept that he did the <coughs> amount of research which he told the court he had done. Um, so that, that is a material error in terms of research. There is a, a point which, for present purposes, um, there is a point, my lord, it, it's the final sentence of my paragraph 12, where uh, there is an objection on our part to do with the factual findings at 153 subpara 3 and 4 to do with Lawson's first article not referring to um, various tweets um, relatively early in the exchanges between Miss Riley and Rose. Uh, and the, the difficulty that we have for present purposes is that the parties aren't in agreement. No. If, if I can explain the, and I don't know if this correspondence has found its way to the court, I wasn't aware it had, my lord, but in summary, the bundle that went before Mrs Justice Stain wasn't agreed because we only received it shortly before the hearing. Uh, we had to produce our own supplementary bundle because it omitted various relevant documents which we had disclosed and asked to be included. Uh, nonetheless, we proceeded. No one alighted on this issue to do with the fact that the version of Lawson's first article in the trial bundle omitted these tweets. Uh, and there's been discussion um, between the instructing solicitors as to how that might have come about. What isn't in dispute, my lord, is that the correct, well, we say the correct version of the Lawson article was previously before the court. It was before Mr Justice Saney when he was first asked to adjudicate on whether or not there could be a preliminary trial of fact, opinion and meaning. Uh, and the parties in agreement that that's the version that the court saw. It, it's the version that Mr. Uh, Sivia has always said that he saw uh, for present purposes, because I, I appreciate that this is a, a matter that the court clearly can't um, determine. Uh, and I also acknowledge the, the difficulty that the trial judge is in if the correct document isn't before her. But the point I would make for um, the present exercise is this, or two points, if, if you like. Um, the trial judge found at paragraph 153 that Mr. Sivia was sufficiently interested in the two Lawson articles that he probably clicked on the hyperlinks to the tweets provided in the articles. Well, that did, the first article did have those tweets um, within it. And the second point I would make, similar to the point I made earlier concerning how Twitter works, is that if the judge was considering taking this point against Mr. Sivia because it hadn't been raised by my learned friend, and no one else was seemingly aware of it until um, this appeal, then, uh, again, as a matter of fairness, it should have been a matter raised with him. Because ultimately, in the final analysis, this is part of the findings against him, essentially on credibility, that when he told the court that he had researched this article as fully as he said he had, um, he wasn't to be believed. So uh, I suggest that's where... Well, all, all the judge is doing here is taking the evidence in front of her and saying that um, it, it only contains so many hyperlinks. That's yeah. not a finding on Mr Sivia's credibility. In fact, it's in, in, in his favour that, that he accepts that he clicked on the hyperlinks that were there. It's just that you didn't put the right document in. Well, it, it, it's... Isn't it? I mean, it's how it looks to me. It, it, it's quite difficult to, to, to mount an appeal on the basis of evidence that wasn't before the judge. Yeah, um, but was previously before the court. Well, my lord. Yeah, but but that's not the judge's fault or, or, or the other side's fault necessarily. I mean, I, it's I, the evidence the judge had, and um, unless you're trying to say that there should be an appeal on the basis of fresh evidence, I, I, I'm, well, um, I it, can't see where this gets you. It, it's not it's not a fresh evidence point. It, it's this, my lord. The as I read the judgment, and of course, 153 is part of the ratio finding against reasonable belief. Um, the, the judge makes a, a number of criticisms concerning the material available to Mr Sivia uh, on the assumption that he, he read all of these hyperlinks. Uh, and the judge follows that in um, far more um, pronounced terms at 154, where there are findings reached against him concerning the amount of research that he had done. 
that the fact that um, in two respects paragraph 153 is wrong points that weren't taken at trial uh, and Mississippi wasn't otherwise on notice of until um, he receives a judgment I, I suggest are matters that can properly go to um, commission my law but, but I, 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 yeah, I see. Yeah. No you, it's a, you, you're putting it as a fairness point it's a slightly different way from the, uh, the manner in which it's raised in the grounds of appeal because you're essentially saying that these were unfair findings of fact um, well the when, when the when the this was when this was drafted the the understanding of um, those on our side is that this was a clear error because the article had the tweets in it um, it's only upon raising it with uh, patron that there's been an explanation as to how it was that the incorrect version came to be in the bundle so I, I, but it is uh, obviously given the um, time that I have I, I won't no I understand that. I, I think I've got the very well. The, the, just um, to the point, and I understand it's, it's understandably different for the yes. reasons that you give. The the next point is is one of um, a, a critical importance to this application, and that is the fact that Miss Riley um, juxtaposed tweets of roses with reports of um, anti-Semitic terrorist attacks um, in the third read that she published and again the the case had been clearly set out in pleadings and evidence there was no challenge against this whatsoever the um my learned friend was simply silent in the way that he um considered mr Sibia's evidence and uh, miss riley herself didn't put anything forward by way of her own evidence if my lord has had time to look at the exchange and i for present purposes, given the time we have, I, I won't turn it up, but within this thread, um, Miss Riley begins by saying, this is tweet uh, 102, this is how it all started. I've taken screen grabs of the conversation that I, so that I could remove Rose's handle, although she's still identifiable, um, and she goes on. But that's the opening gambit. We then have the juxtaposition, the tweet an issue, tweet 104, every week at Labour Against Anti-Semitism does a review of the last seven days' worth of anti-Semitism. If you're interested, follow them. Refusal to condemn murder of 11 Jews in Pittsburgh article. Then goes on to juxtapose that original tweet with uh, something completely unconnected from Rose on the 17th of December. And, and that thread ends, my lord, and this is at tweet 108 with the conclusion that Miss uh, Riley arrives at, this has a direct parallel with the spread of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is a whole bunch of conspiracy theories about Jews control the world, media, banks, wars, any BS people want to say they can. It takes effort to fight this, and we need help. We need um, active allies, hashtag active allies. That prompted the third dog pile. Uh, and what Mr. Sibia said is that this juxtaposition was part of an attempt to implicate Rose in um, anti-Semitism more widely, uh, and that had caused the third dog pile and the bullying which he sought to blow the whistle on in his article. Um, it, it, it was our case that this we need hashtag active allies in effect was a call to arms of the 600,000... That Mr Sivia believed at the time? Yes, yes, yes. that's right, yes. What, what he believed at the time. So... It, it's an important point. It was at the right at the very um, foundation of his case, and um, it wasn't challenged, my lord, uh, and it deserved some consideration. Um, we don't have that. We don't even have consideration along the lines of Mr. Sivir has said that this was a juxtaposition, however, I find. Um, what, what is said latterly by Ms. Sivir through counsel is, and this is paragraph 12 of my learned friends. Uh, written submission of the 19th of January. He says, Steve's counsel spent much time in his all closing submissions on this point, but since on even the most cursory inspection, there is no juxtaposition in tweet 104 as properly understood. There was no intended insinuation of a linkage between the two separated matters. Well, uh, it, it's curious that we have some sort of explanation when there has been no evidence on this previously. Uh, and it begs the question, well, why was there a link? If, as Mr. Stable says, 
the two matters were separated. We know that Miss Riley, on other occasions, when she sought to publish what Rose had said previously, simply published the tweets. Whereas on this occasion, she's collated them um, next to this unrelated matter to create, as Mr. Sillia said, in the mind of the uh, reader, uh, a juxtaposition which has gives the tweet of Rose a, a far more serious and sinister complexion than in fact it bears. So um, that, 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 as I say, it's, it's an explanation that comes too late um, on Miss Riley's behalf and it doesn't explain the matter which formed the reasonable belief that Mr Sivia had when he published. Um, relatedly, my Lord, another matter which didn't, um, which wasn't considered by the judge um, in her consideration of reasonable belief, but had been at the forefront of Mr. Sivia's case from, from the very start. And that is his view that the conduct of Miss Riley in continuing to monitor and surveil the account of Rose post blog constituted harassment, not least within the criminal definition of Section 2A of the 1997 Act. Um, th this, this was a point that had been made at the time by onlookers. Uh, it was a point that Mr Sivia had always um, made uh, since the inception of his case, and it was something that he wasn't <coughs> asked any questions about, nor was there any evidence from Miss uh, Riley as to her conduct in respect to this. So again, it, it called for some consideration by the court, um, and there is none whatsoever. Uh, the only other point I would make in respect of this, the, the submissions that my Lord would have seen deal with section 2A3, the offence of stalking in terms of D and G, monitoring um, by electronic communication or G, watching or spying on a person. But, but of course, before that, as my Lord will know, there's C, publishing any statement <coughs> or any other material relating to or purporting to relate to a person or purporting to originate from a person. <coughs> Well, isn't the problem this that your your um, the the issue for the judge was whether, on the basis of the tweets in their context, it was reasonable for Mr. Sivia to believe a that what he was saying was true and b that it was in the public interest to say it. Yes. So that really turns on an analysis of the tweets, um, and the judge held that um, it was not reasonable. Indeed, she went so far as to say it wasn't arguably the case that um, what he said was true. Um, she doesn't have to mention every point that he makes. She has to listen to it and reach some conclusion. Uh, so that's, the, that's, the, that's the case against you, obviously. Of course. Uh, and my lord, <coughs> if, if this was, if I, if I use the term pedantry, I, I, if this was in the nature of some of those facts Type sprint room pedantic challenges. The judge has missed this point in evidence, and therefore the whole edifice of the case must necessarily come tumbling down. It would be a bad point, and it wouldn't be a point that I um, uh, would run this morning. It, it's the very opposite. It's because the judge has misunderstood Twitter and has misunderstood the means by which Riley has continued to monitor publish, collate, misrepresent the tweets, which Mr. Sivia, as, uh, as a uh, committed Twitter user and journalist, understood readily from what he was seeing at the time he published the article, that this issue to do with harassment has been ignored. So I accept the case against me. Well, you lose on this point because the judge found that, in fact, Riley hadn't continued to um, surveil the tweets, if you like, but of course we know, or at least it appears, that the judge misunderstood that point and so never engaged with Mr. Sivia's case. So it's for that reason that we say the commission should be granted uh, and why the point is clearly arguable. <coughs> and, and, and in terms of um, the next matter regarding errors, uh, conduct of Miss Oberman. Um, You've already heard me on the judge, what we say is the judge's misunderstanding to do with visibility of Miss Oberman's tweet yeah. by Miss Riley. Um, it, 
my lord will see, it was said at 100, uh, paragraph 177 by the judge, it's readily understandable that even if well-intentioned, Rose may have found this offer, and more particularly its repetition in a deluge of emails that, that should be tweaks, unwelcome and over overwhelming, so much that her father intervened online to protest against this attention. <coughs> Well, well, this is what Mr. Sivir understood to be the harassment. The, the problem in my submission with the judge's analysis there is that the suggestion this might have been well-intentioned, the judge arrives at that conclusion uh, having omitted content of tweets 202 through to 208. Uh, and these are the tweets in the early hours um, of the uh, morning in early January where Miss Overman's uh, stance becomes hostile uh, and she uh, states that the, she attacks, she explicitly attacks the father and then suggests that Rose isn't the child that she says she is. Uh, and what we say about those, uh, and if my Lord wants to look at them, they're at four bundle from 328 onwards. These were central to the analysis concerning harassment of the <coughs> child by Miss Overman. Uh, and sorry, where, where am I going to find this? These are at, it, it's in the core bundle at 200, sorry, 328. So we see from 202 onwards. <clears throat> yes. 203, I blame the dad. 204, you're using a child, disgusting. 205, 18 year old. Girl. <coughs> well, the child had always said she was 16. Um, it's unclear why Miss Overman, other than perhaps trying to cover tracks, um, is it, suggesting there that she's not a child. Uh, and then goes on at 206 to recognise the fact that there apparently has been a pile on of her previously. And then at 208, my Lord C, I, I think she might be a bit over 16. She tweets like a grown up, but I've lost. Com lost complete interest now etc so the <coughs> date my lord sees there January 12th that's at 3.08 yeah. these are all very early in the morning and then it follows with onlookers suggesting that perhaps this constituted harassment and it's what she shouldn't have done now the judge sends it, says against Mr Sivia here well tweet 213 which my lord has at 3.39 that's simply um, Miss Riley tweeting in support. She could have been tweeting in support for, for any reasons. It's not necessarily her condoning any bullying or <coughs> harassment. The, the difficulty with that is that it ignores the fourth thread and what Miss Riley said there in terms of adopting the um, attack of Miss Oberman against the child. So for instance, my Lord has uh, at page 351, tweet 225, And then importantly, at, at 227, adults, this is at page 353, adults using a child's profile exploiting mental health issues to fuel campaigns of hate intimidation is disgusting. Exactly the same termination, ter terminology that was used by Ms. Oberman. I hope her friends, teachers, or social workers reading this step in and help, but using these nefarious tactics don't mean that we have to accept blame or, or not refute lies. Um, Sorry, you said... Just now, tweet 225 was the, 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 the one that had been so two, um, ignored by the judge. A 225 <coughs> and, and importantly, <coughs> 227, my lord. <coughs> that, that, that's the attack of Miss Oberman. Uh, this isn't a child, it's disgusting, in effect. Uh, and my Lord will see, just at the end of that thread, it's at 228, it should be on the next page. Miss Riley ends, thank you to everyone who continues to um, hashtag be louder. It, this caused the fourth um, dog pile, which was even bigger than all of those that went previously. Um, the point being that the, um, the attention, the bullying, the harassment of Rose only became worse. So the, the, the judge's um, dismissal of the case concerning Miss Oberman and the support, again, 
um, where the there hadn't been um, there were questions by Mr. Stables I accept to do with Miss Overman's tweets. Um, but the the point being, in the absence of, of dealing with uh, 225, 227, uh, and what Mr. Sivia considered that they showed in terms of support, endorsement, adoption of the previous attacks by Oberman, um, it, it wasn't a conclusion which could properly be reached on the facts. And conscious of time, I, I'll take these points quickly, my Lord, but the, the next issue to do with omission of dogpiling details. Um, it, it is entirely artificial in my submission, and more importantly, in Mr. Sivia's case concerning his um, journalism on this, to detach the reality of what these pylons were from the subject matter of the exchanges involving Riley and the child. Um, you have the figures within um, my written submission, my lord. There was no challenge against those. And it, it goes, one sees the increasing attention drawn towards Rose after she has tried to step back and retreat from the fray and said that repeatedly. Um, the continued publication of her tweets in January led to even more attention and adverse attention than there had been previously. Now, it's, it's not simply Mr. Sivia blowing the whistle on this. It, it's the fact, my lord, as, as this court will know, as, this, as the court beneath should have known, that because of the environment that society finds itself in concerning online bullying, and one only has to look at the, um, the online safety bill uh, and what it says about prioritising children online, and making pile-on harassment a criminal offence, that these issues were central to the public interest in the article that Mr. Sivia was addressing. So if one is to divorce them from the facts and not include them, then what one has in my submission is a judgment um, which is entirely devoid and sanitised of the very real effect that this conduct had upon the child victim. But, but she found it didn't. That's the problem, isn't it? I mean, there's, there's no dispute about the, what happened. The judge's finding was that there was no reasonable basis for a belief that this had been caused by the claimant. Now, you have an attack on that conclusion, but well, it's difficult logically. It's a confusion, isn't it, to say, well, these terrible things happened, and the judge should have um, factored in when considering whether Miss Ryan was to blame that these terrible things happened. Well, it, it, I, I, I respectfully disagree for this reason. The judge <coughs> notes that in respect of Oberman's conduct, um, <coughs> that, as I've already pointed out, that it could, um, in my submission, be viewed as harassment, which plainly I suggest it could be. And I pointed out why the connection between um, Riley's support hasn't been properly addressed. But moreover, the judge herself Notes, notes at paragraph 174, it's not unreasonable to think that it would have been better if Miss Riley had let it lie when Rose said she was putting the debate behind her. But that's a point that goes to the, 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 the point that I've said is logically relevant, which is whether there's a basis for believing that Miss Riley was blameworthy. Yes. And that she was doing the things that the article said she was doing. But, but, um, but there is... Uh, the, the, this is, is a bit like a, a, a road traffic accident. There are five cars involved at the time. Um, the fact that it's a terrible accident doesn't implicate any one of them. You've got to look at what they did. Well, it, 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 the, the difficulty with that, my lord, and it's what is at the very heart of <clears> this case, is that it, in the absence of any consideration of material facts as set out on the ground one, either because they're not discussed at all or they're misunderstood within the judgment, then one arrives at this entirely sanitised, detached view of the conduct of the claimant. Now, if, if I'm right in what I say about these matters concerning stalking, harassment, juxtaposition, support of Oberman, then, then the judge would have been forced, I suggest, to look at the very real effect that this had on the individual 
and then would have been forced to consider whether or not Mr Sivir was reasonable in what he said. Um, just briefly on this, my Lord, on the, I won't deal with the last point by reason of time, which is to do with the gaslighting of Rose. That's essentially to do with uh, the, the narrative not being uh, understood by the judge. But an important point to do with reasons for not contacting the claimant, which seems to have been um, possibly the, the single reason that found against um, Mr. Sivia most tellingly, that the points that he made, and, and just to list them, she hadn't responded to previous challenges concerning her conduct by people online, and there were many of those within the judgment and many within the evidence. There's no consideration of urgency, whether by way of waiting Article 10 and Article 8 or at all, or, or using the, the old Reynolds factors. Then, in terms of, uh, you have my supplementary submission at paragraph 11, and the point that's made there was the, the reasonableness of not contacting Rose, uh, and the fact that Mr. Sivia considered that any opportunity given to Miss Riley might lead to further attacks against Rose. Now, if, if what I've said this morning regarding the third and fourth of the threads is correct, and the judge's errors to do with that, then surely that point um, is one which should have carried water. Uh, and the last point to make here, my Lord, and I emphasise it because it's something I hadn't put in my written submissions, that the findings at 159, which is where we say the judge erred in terms of how Twitter works. Importantly, 159 deals with the issue about not seeking comment from the claimant. So it, if I'm right in what I say about the judge's errors there, it, it follows that the judge's, or the force of the judge's view to do with not seeking comment um, is uh, attenuated, if, if not undermined. And then, very briefly, um, Section 4, Editorial Judgment, you, you have the references from myself and yes, my learning Yes, that was very helpful. Um, there's no consideration whatsoever, and importantly, my Lord, hearing the voice of the victim, Mr Sivia, as the whistleblower, and as seeking to counter, if you like, the national narrative, um, and urgency there. And the final point, in terms of ground three, and some of these matters have already been touched on to do with, if you like, procedural fairness and letting Mr Sivia know the case against him. What we weren't dealing with here, my Lord, we weren't dealing with a flood case. Well, what has said to have been the suspicion has since been shown to be wrong. We, we weren't dealing with a bank's case where it was subsequently shown that the National Crime Agency had concluded there were no criminal offences and there was in fact no evidential basis for suggesting that banks had received funding from third parties, nor were we dealing with a, a Le Chaux case where the journalist who's put up to give evidence, Mr Gore, doesn't take issues with the findings of uh, Mr Justice Moskin in the family court saying that the former partner and um, that her story was unreliable. We, we weren't dealing with that. We were dealing with a strikeout on a technical basis in which no evidence had gone before Mrs Justice Collins Rice. Just, I just want to understand the, 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 the procedural, um, the way that where, where this sits in your um, appeal. Um, I, I, am I right in thinking that you, you said the judge's approach to the Section 4 defence was infected by consideration of the truth or falsity of the allegations, which was an irrelevant consideration. Yes. Yeah. And you say, I think, secondly, that the way that she dealt with it was unfair. Yes. Yeah. And so that's that's a ground of appeal against the uh, dismissal of the Section 4 defence. Correct. It's not a standalone complaint that the judge just shouldn't have dealt with truth. No. Uh, no. Because it, if it, it, I can see how it could be that. Yeah. Uh, but that would be a different that would have a different consequence. I, 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 yes, I, I accept that. The, the point is this, my Lord, that the, there'd be no merits assessment on the truth defence. And so to treat it as though there had been, because of a strikeout um, hearing, which was not a summary judgment hearing, because presumably those on the other side took a view about that, um, I say was a clear error. And where I say it feeds into the procedural points is to the extent that the judge was 
had in her mind points um, of evidence against Mr. Sivia, um, then I should have been, if the judge was minded, to open this all up. Uh, and I can see how there might be difficulties with that because of the very different parameters of the, um, uh, the public interest defence compared to truth. But if that was the way that the judge wanted to go, then it, it should have been the case that we were allowed to ask Miss Riley about these matters that the judge adjudicated on, contrary to my client's case. Because otherwise, it, it leads to the sort of unfairness which I suggest is at the um, is at the foundation of the um, number of errors that were made in consideration of the evidence which I've discussed in rounds one and two. Right, I, I follow. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, I don't think so. Okay. Mr. Stables, yeah. Uh, my lord, given the um, uh, pressure of time, uh, I, I will deal with the uh, matters raised by the appellant on this. Uh, Briefly, yes. But I do want to make two very uh, quick uh, general submissions first. Uh, the first of those is is to observe that her ladyship's judgment is very detailed. It's thorough. Uh, it's careful. All the relevant facts are set out. The law is applied to those facts, and the the conclusions reached are uh, fully reasoned. Uh, I suggest that uh, it would take something. Uh, really quite extraordinary for the uh, appellant to be able to satisfy the test of real prospect of success. Uh, the, the second brief submission I make in general terms is that Mr. Uh, the, the appellant, Mr. Sivia, failed both as to uh, what he did before publishing. So the judge concluded that he did not do the research that he claimed to have done. And he also failed, and this is put in terms in paragraph 163 of the judgment, he also failed on the basis of the reasonableness of the <coughs> belief that he came to, even if he did do the research. In other words, if he got over the first hurdle, which he didn't, he would nevertheless have failed at the second. Uh, those, uh, my lord, I suggest are um, uh, are, are significant to this appeal or this, to this application rather uh, but I'll, I'll take the grounds uh, in the order uh, that my learned friend did uh, which follows the order of, of his skeleton yes. argument um, how Twitter works then the as a general comment however which applies throughout whatever the substance of the matters raised, there is, in most cases, a fundamental reason why that would fail. In other words, there are other reasons. Even if, even if there is substance to the points raised, there are fundamental reasons why uh, they cannot take the appeal any further. Um, so far as I do need to deal with this quickly, uh, but it's a late point that's come up from the appellant. Uh, as to the form of the uh, article that he relies on. It's the Lawson Enough is Enough article. And he says this wasn't the right one, and the bundle wasn't agreed, and so on. Well, the bundle was agreed, uh, certainly in the sense that there was never any objection raised at all to any of the contents that were there. My learned friend's point appears to be that there were things that were not there that were then put in as a supplemental bundle, but there was absolutely nothing raised about what was there. Uh, uh, now, I... I uh, accept this, this is not before the court, uh, and I can only give submissions on instructions uh, of, in this respect, and it is very recent that the appellant's instructing solicitors have been writing to my uh, to the claimant's instructing solicitors saying, will you please concede this point as to the Lawson article and so on, and we don't concede the point. And in the course of that, the appellant's uh, solicitors sent us the version that they used for a bundle before Mr. Justice Saini. It contains the same tweets that are in the trial bundle, trial bundle B, tab 20 for, for reference. It contains those same tweets. What is put before the court now 
by <coughs> the appellant in the uh, supplementary bundle is not what was relied on in front of Mr Justice Saining. Indeed, it is possible, I don't want to uh, go on uh, too long about this, simply because it's technical detail that, that um, is, not, is not helpful. But what is, on, what is in the supplementary bundle is what is online now. The article has changed and uh, uh, embedded tweets have become static images. Those images were not on display on the face of the article, and that is demonstrated by what was put forward by the uh, appellant himself for the earliest of the bundles, and we say the earliest uh, uh, versions of these articles. It, it, it's possible to show the articles changed in other respects over time, uh, but the earliest will be the most reliable. And so far as it's relevant, To the appellant's point on this, um, the, the the two, the earliest and uh, bundle and the trial bundle are on all fours in, in respect of what's contested. Okay. Um, Absolutely. The uh, on on research, the pa paragraph one five four, which my learned friend um, did refer to, gives five bases on which the judge came to her ladyship came to her. View, uh, as to uh, uh, rejecting the evidence, <coughs> excuse me, given by uh, uh, Mr. Sivia as to what he did and how long it took him and so on. Um, she says very, uh, her ladyship said very plainly at number one that Mr. Sivia was not intending to write an article on the matter. Number two, uh, uh, and very importantly, I suggest it, he, there is nothing in the article that's complained of that shows, as the judge finds uh, would have been likely, that he, uh, that, that the appellant would have referred to that. In other words, if one inspects the article complained of, it gives absolutely no reason to suppose, which is likely, that he would have referred to his research, the fact of it, or, or other, uh, uh, or, or detail of it. Number four, one five, uh, paragraph one five four, uh, Roman four, is, is is absolutely fundamental. The appellant came the, the, at no point in any of this litigation, certainly at trial, was there a shred of evidence, documentary evidence, of what the uh, appellant had done. He didn't record a single thing. There's no evidence in documentary form of any of his research, and. Uh, the, the judge notes <coughs> that, and the judge says very uh, makes makes a very clear and, and um, as one would expect, uh, a reference to the uh, uh, unreliability of memory. I might also, in this respect, say there was a general finding. It's a paragraph twenty one uh, that uh, Mr. Sivia's evidence was, to a considerable extent, <coughs> unreliable. Um, uh, 154 Roman 5 is again documentary evidence and this is from the pen of the appellant himself. He published an article in December 2019, this was shortly after the uh, meaning determination uh, of Mr Justice Nicklin. Uh, uh, he published an article saying, um, I have spent the last week looking up evidence to prove the claims in that sentence. This was put to uh, Mr uh, Sylvia at trial uh, he responded, he said, well, I, I wasn't finding it. I was going back to what I knew was there. But it, the judge clearly uh, concludes following this. Uh, and, and, and it is noted, that that very point is noted, yes. although Mr. Sivia uh, claimed that evidence is gathering material, um, this is not the impression given by what he wrote. The defence, and subsequently the amended defence, was based on materials gathered a substantial period after the publication of the article. Now, we're, we're, the point I make uh, on, a, on, a, on a general basis here is that any of these would dispose of the argument that because Mr. Sivia had written something previously, he must therefore, we are invited, to, the court's been invited to infer that uh, Mr. Sivia did do what he says he did. When there is documentary evidence relied on by the judge, I, I suggest that, that that point gets Mr. gets the appellant no further uh, at all. Uh, I, I, again, uh, briefly, my lord, I just interject here. Uh, by my, my my reference was to Henderson uh, and Foxworth in the original 
uh, in the original statement opposing permission to appeal. Um, yes. Uh, I, I have copies <coughs> with me, but I, I don't propose to hand them up. No, well, look, they're familiar, familiar cases. Lord Reed's very clear that, that, that uh, uh, appellate courts are bound, unless there's a compelling reason to the contrary, to uh, assume the trial judge has taken all the evidence into consideration. Uh, and I rely strongly on that in respect of what uh, the appellant says is missing, as it were, from the uh, judges, from her ladyship's consideration. Uh, uh, I'll turn then very quickly to this question of how Twitter works. Uh, the, the, the amended defence itself pleads that uh, for a person who's blocked, uh, and this is on the basis that the uh, claimant was blocked by Rose, yeah. they must, uh, uh, and this is in the amended defence, that they can see the uh, tweets of the blocking person by uh, logging out or by having people send them and so on. Uh, in fact, I, I can quote is paragraph 19 of the amended defence. C could have, quote, opened a new Twitter account in another name. There's not a shred of evidence that any of this happened, incidentally. It's no, nothing, nothing. It's all, it's all conjecture. Used a third party to monitor her account or logged out in order to observe Rose's account anonymously. Now, leaving aside the slightly tendentious um, <coughs> uh, adjectives that are inserted into there, the simple fact is that anybody could simply look at any tweet from any person with a public account without any uh, uh, real difficulty at all. And for this to be uh, supposedly uh, a basis to argue stalking, uh, I suggest is, is, is simply wrong. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's barely arguable, frankly. The, the question of how Twitter works, uh, I, it doesn't, I suggest there's, there's, there's nothing in what Her Ladyship said about the uh, uh, alleged monitoring or stalking. Her Ladyship gave an example. Whether that example is, is strictly true or not, is, or is strictly accurate or not, I just doesn't o overcome the generality of the point Her Ladyship makes, which is that there are different ways of, of looking at people's public tweets. The simplest one, uh, I suggest, is simply to log out and then have a look at them that way. Um, as to, uh, and this is put uh, early in my uh, learned friend skeleton and then developed later on in, in ground one for conduct of Tracy and Oberman, but I'll take them together. He's simply wrong. But there's an irony in this that paragraph uh, seven of the opponent skeleton argument uh, it says the assumption at paragraphs 84 and 159 that C, uh, that the claimant would only have seen those tweets of Ms Oberman's in which she was tagged or which was fired, ignores the fact that because the claimant was a follower of Ms Oberman's, all of her tweets to Rose would have appeared. That's wrong. It's just straightforwardly wrong. It's not how Twitter works. Uh, and the irony being that the challenge to the judge's understanding of Twitter uh, fails on the basis of it is simply wrong. Um, so how am I to know that it's, <clears throat> that it's wrong? I mean, this is the problem that we had <laughs> Munro and Hopkins because people came along saying Twitter works this way, Twitter works that way, and I said, "Well, where's the evidence?" Well, um, <coughs> my lord, I, <coughs> uh, I I haven't put evidence in on this. This is a new point anyway. This, yes. this, what, this, this didn't come up below. Um, uh, but the <laughs> I, I won't go to it because your lordships make clear that the, the appendix in Munro and Hopkins is is not authority, and it was was simply agreed between the parties. Yeah. But uh, the I'm, I'm, I pass on the instructions that I have on which is that a reply would be received by the recipient, i.e. the person replied to, uh, in their notifications, or if they were a follower of the person replying, in their timeline. Yeah. They would, and this, th th there is something of this in the appendix of Munro and Hopkins in respect of at replies, but if a person who is a third party to the reply follows one or other, they know nothing of it. It's not, it's not sent to them. They don't get it. They will only receive it if they are common followers. Uh, 
but I, uh, yeah. th there isn't any evidence. Well, that. if there's no evidence, then um, your point has to be that Mr. Mr. Mitchell doesn't have any evidence to support what he's saying. Yes. You can't well, say that it's contrary to the evidence for a judge to find what she uh, did, but um, the, the other side of that coin is that <laughs> um, the judge may not have had any evidence to. No, in, in, to in, reach the conclusion that she did. In, in, indeed, I, I'll press it no further than there's no evidence for, for, for this, for this uh, assertion by the appellant, and we said wrong. Uh, now, the, the juxtaposition point, uh, I, I, do, I, I don't, I don't uh, disagree that this was not the subject of argument or, or, or uh, it, that it was put to Mr. Uh, Sivia below, but uh, this is very much, I suggest, uh, um, a Henderson point that it, it, it was for the judge to consider, uh, and there's an absolutely no suggestion that the judge uh, overlooked this, and there's certainly no compelling reason to suppose so, not least because, uh, and I don't believe this point to be contested, that uh, my learned friend spent a long time talking about it in his, in his closing submissions. It would have been readily apparent to her ladyship, uh, and the fact that she didn't bother with it, uh, I suggest um, is some indication of the quality of the argument uh, put forward by um, the appellant in that respect. I've dealt with harassment, my lord, I've dealt with um, uh, the how to achieve works in respect to Tracy Ann Overman. The omission of dogpiling details, yeah. I think this is an entire red herring. It, it was very clearly put to Mr. Sivia that he was unreasonable in supposing that my client, the, the, the claimant, could be held responsible for the actions of others on Twitter. And indeed, uh, and the judge remarks on this, she positively discouraged people from engaging in this sort of behaviour. It was wholly unreasonable. There's, there's no basis at all for making any sort of uh, uh, argument of reasonable belief, objectively judged, on the basis of uh, that Rose was unfortunately uh, subjected to rude emails from other people. They weren't encouraged by my client, and that's of course the the, the meaning, both uh, uh, the single meaning and the and the uh, bonic meaning. And the judge deals with that uh, also. Uh, uh, gaslighting, my learned friend didn't cover, uh, but the, it is it is plainly um, uh, thrown out. Uh, on the basis of, or well, it's not thrown out, but it's uh, the, the judge did uh, spend some time at, at paragraphs um, uh, one six three onwards on this very point. That there was nothing that my client did that could conceivably have given rise to a, a reasonable belief in public interest publication uh, on the basis of the content uh, or anything else of her of her tweets. Uh, the Ground, ground three, uh, I will, uh, I, I will have to deal with um, uh, head on, as it were. Uh, at trial, there were two, uh, broadly speaking, two approaches to cross examination, two subjects uh, that my uh, client was cross examined about, and one is reflected in the judgment uh, in respect of bad reputation. Uh, and allegedly what were Burstein particulars, uh, and, it, and, and it goes to aggravation. The judge was very clear about that. They were, they were quite improper. The other related set of line of questioning, which didn't go very far, was uh, of my client and what she did, what she sent. Uh, and now, I, I, I will say, I intervened, and I said, this... this this cannot have anything to do with it. There is no defense of truth. This is not appropriate. And the judge agreed. And then the judge uh, pressed my learned friend as to why he was asking about matters that had absolutely nothing to do with what was inside Mr. Sivia's head when he published his article. Uh, uh, it, it seems to me, uh, I don't entirely follow the logic that my learned friend uses here, but it seems to me uh, really very obvious that the reason that evidence of my client's activity wasn't tested was because it was wholly irrelevant. It was solely what Mr. Uh, Sevilla knew and what he reasoned from what he knew. Um, my Lord, I've 
believe I've come to the end of my lot of time. Yes. Uh, um, unless there's anything further I can assist with. What do you say about um, just one point about um, editorial judgment? Well, e e editorial judgment, I, I, I won't uh, go into um, the case law economy and, and so on. No. I, I don't, I don't, th th there's no dispute, I think. The well, I think it's clear. The, the judge um, set out the section. She yes. included uh, reference to editorial judgment in a discussion of the legal principles, but she said nothing about it after that. But, well, my lord, no. The, right. But the the, um, the what Mr. Sivius, what, what is said in the in the skeleton argument, uh, is uh, to some extent a. Um, uh, simply a restatement of, 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 of matters which are bound up with the judgment generally. In other words, uh, uh, it is said that Rose's voice should be heard. Now, there is an objection, I accept this wasn't put to, the, put to uh, uh, Mr. Sivia, but on its face, uh, it's got really very little to do with Rose's voice. It's, a, it's straightforwardly an attack on my client. Uh, and it, in, indeed, uh, she's attacked for various other things she's alleged to have done in the article complained of. Uh, the, the, the source material point uh, is, uh, uh, was, was dealt with at length. Uh, Your Lordship may recall that when this case was before this court uh, some time mm -hmm. ago, uh, the judgment of the court was that, uh, you're quite right, yeah, I accept entirely, my Lord. <laughs> Too late to disagree with it now. <laughs> well, yeah, quite so. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> that the uh, the, the Lawson articles were not before this court, and the, and the, this court could not come to a view on whether a reasonable belief could have been uh, could have arisen from those in combination with other material and so on and so forth. Well, they were before her ladyship, and they and and a considerable amount of time was spent on what they were, what they said, uh, indeed down to where Mr. Lawson lives, that he published on a an open access American website, and so on and so forth. So this. It, it was all explored. Um, the urgency that that was replied to that, that that was dealt with in the reply. It was also dealt with generally uh, in in questions. That the it, it cannot be, I suggest, that a uh, that editorial judgment could be exercised on the basis of uh, simply denying all the usual uh, steps as the law requires to form uh, a, an objectively judged reasonable belief in public interest publication. In other words, it, it seems to me that the application of, of the editorial judgment here is a means, an attempt to say, well, we, we, we simply want to overturn everything on the basis that, that, that the appellant thought it was appropriate for him not to do something. Uh, it, it, it's 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 an it's a I suggest it's a wrongful application of the entire principle. Right. Um, uh, that covers the point that I wanted to hear from you on. Uh, I'm grateful. Yes, Mr. Mitchell, reply. Um, my lord, in terms of this issue to do with the. Uh, the, the paragraphs at 153 that we say included tweets. Uh, my, my solicitor points out he's not in attendance. Um, you've heard what's said about agreement to be to do with the bundles as disagreement as to whether there was agreement. But the yes. point is, the point hadn't come to light, not least because the unusual circumstances to do with hand down of this judgment, where only counsel could see it up until now before the judgment was handed down. The moment it was handed down, Mr. Sivia then passed on instructions which highlighted what he considered to be the error there based on the article and there's a disagreement to do with what was before Mr Justice Saini. Um, the point overall if, I, if I'm right in my points to do with omissions and errors then what is said against my client concerning if you like broadly credibility falls by the wayside uh, and just to pick up on one of Mr Stable's points which he said was fatal the lack of any record of documentary evidence to do with research. It, again, looking at the body of case law, and there, there isn't, as my Lord will know, there isn't very much as it continues to be a developing area. This isn't an investigative journalist talking to someone about police corruption, domestic abuse, um, 
for hostile foreign states funding of uh, elections in this country where one would expect and as the courts have demonstrated there should be proper records of all of the inquiries that have been taken undertaken what mr sivia said throughout is that all of this took place in public it was for everyone to see and he saw it just as any other watcher could see it because it was on the twitter sphere um and another point which my learned friend said um found against uh, and did in mrs justice Dane's um estimation find against him concerning his statement about um the inquiries that he made in december 2019 the important point here my lord is that this was following the determination before mr justice nicklin where he said various parts of the statement are allegations of fact and you now need to go and prove those um, by way of a, a truth defence, and I accept that uh, the judge has found against uh, Mr. Sivia on that point. That was his his explanation, and against the background of what I say, the general errors in the judgment, I suggest that that point can't be dispositive in the way that Mr. Stables um, suggests it is. Uh, the issues to do with um, Oberman and the accessibility of her tweets. Um, the points that are raised today for the first time on instructions about why what we say um, based on Munro and based on our own understanding about accessibility are, are wrong. I obviously can't meet those uh, having been raised for the first time this morning. W what I would say is this, my lord, we look briefly at the fourth thread and if my lord, um, I can read out what Riley said in tweet 224. Um, she said, uh, this is the January 15th thread, uh, for offering to meet her for tea with a, tea with a Jewish girl who's suffering abuse, Tracy, at Tracy Ann O has been accused by Tony and others of trial grooming. Well, she, she could only have known about those invitations to meet the child for tea had she read the tweet. So we don't even need to go into this um, dispute as to how Twitter works. It was there on the evidence. And then... The, in terms of what my learning friend says concerning um, dogpiling details and harassment more generally, we're, we're not in dispute, as Mr. Uh, Sivia has always said, that Miss Riley could have continued viewing Rose's tweets other than from her own account. That has always been his case. His case is to say that that in and of itself constitutes monitoring. But more importantly, in the point that my learned friend still doesn't address in his submissions, it, it doesn't end there. It's the fact that those tweets are collated, they are then republished, and in at least one form, they're juxtaposed with uh, a report of a racist uh, atrocity in the US. Uh, and that's what he was seeking to blow the whistle on. Um, and just in terms of the figures to do with dogpiling, Again, it, it is relevant for this reason, um, my lord. What, one of the aspects of public interest that the court found is to do with the disparity as between an adult celebrity and a child. And that disparity is reflected, disparity in power, I should say, not, not just in terms of their status, but one sees it in very real terms in respect of the respective followings that they have on Twitter. Um, some 600,000 odd of Miss Riley at the time of these tweets and the figures that we had for Rose were in the order of, of 10,000. So that disparity in power is relevant to the question of the effect of the tweets that Riley published about her, um, not least given what I've already adverted to at the end of the third and the fourth dog piles, this, um, this Frida Kerr, if you like, um, talking about being louder <coughs> and needing allies and what we know followed in, in terms of abuse um, after that, um, after those two publications. So, so the figures are important. Um, and then briefly on editorial judgment, of course, the, the two maps I highlight in my written submission are not just Mr. Sivir as a whistleblower on behalf of the child victim. It's also this charge of hypocrisy and the hypocrisy which is, was at the start, the, the middle and the end of his article is what um, he was primarily concerned with. And of course that goes to the tenor and the tone of the article, which is relevant to the way that he sought to describe the conduct of uh, Miss Riley when he spoke of her in terms 
of having um, harassed and being, as he says, within the, the um, actual article itself, a serial abuser. So that that, that matters. My difficulty with um, the editorial judgment point is this, quite simply. If the judge was entitled to conclude that there was no reasonable basis for making the allegations that were conveyed, mostly intentionally, um, by Mr. Sibia in this article, how can editorial judgment justify doing it? Well, it, it is an editorial judgment that uh, is a reasonable editorial judgment to to publish things that you don't have a reasonable basis for believing to be true. Well, the, um, because it would be good if they were. It would be a good thing to do if they were true. I mean, it doesn't, I, yeah. I just find it a bit logically difficult. Well, it, it, it comes in <coughs> at these stages, my lord. It, it, it's specifically referred to in respect of um, what we say is ground one. And one, when looks at all of the circumstances, it includes editorial judgment. Uh, and it comes in more importantly for this reason, my lord. I, 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 I suggest it would be a difficult argument if this is Mr. Stable's argument, and he hasn't made it um, expressly, but to say, well, the judge was against Mr. Sivia so comprehensively, she didn't even have to address this because it was irrelevant. Um, that, that I, I suggest, isn't a good point because... The, uh, and one only has to read Seraphin to see how it was that editorial judgment came to be included within the statute, that the court still has to have regard to the statutory test, even if it finds against Mr. Sivir on it, and it has to dismiss the question of editorial judgment. But, but the overarching... Well, I, I don't think that's correct. I don't think it's what Sivir said, and I don't think it's what the statute says. The statute says that the, the court has to have regard to editorial judgment to the extent it thinks is appropriate. Yes. It doesn't say that it, there's always a, 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 some allowance to be given, um, whatever the circumstances of the case. And there are plenty of cases that say words to the effect that if you're saying something you know is not true, editorial judgment doesn't come into the picture. Well, the, Usually. The, it, could, it could do, because sometimes you'd be passing on what someone else is saying. But those, if you like, that, that takes me to my overarching point, my lord, which is this. In circumstances where all of the defects at ground one um, were not apparent and weren't available to Mr. Sivia, then I still suggest there should be proper regard to um, what is said at subparas two and four concerning editorial judgment. But even if I'm wrong on that, one can see the force in my lord's point. The difficulty is, when one looks at the issues which uh, we say are errors and which uh, my learned friend, to an extent, appears accepted within his submission, then the whole question of tone, tenor, um, and presentation is very much at large. Uh, and these questions to do with what ultimately found against him, if you like, on the strength of the defamatory stink uh, concerning the um, previous judgment of the High Court striking out, th those assume, I suggest, a, a very, very different complexion when one considers that this is a whistleblower who's seeking to correct what he sees as a false narrative in mainstream media, and he's seeking to highlight um, matters fundamentally of hypocrisy. Yes, well, thank you. Um, yes. <clears throat> Uh, this has been the hearing of an application for permission to appeal against a judgment given after a trial of a claim in libel. The claimant is Rachel Riley, a TV presenter and a campaigner against alleged anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. The defendant is Michael Sivia, a blogger who runs a website called VoxPoliticalOnline.com. Ms Riley sued over an article which Mr Sivia published on the website on the 26th of January 2016, under the heading, quotes, serial abuser Rachel Riley to receive, internal quotes, extra protection, close quotes, on grounds that she is receiving abuse, close quotes, um, the article. Miss Riley won the case, so it's Mr. Sivia's proposed appeal that I've been considering today. The history of the case can be shortly summarised. 
Uh, the meaning of the article was decided as a preliminary issue in December 2019 by Mr Justice Nicklin. He held, uh, in summary, that it meant that the claimant had, quote, engaged upon, supported and encouraged a campaign of online abuse and harassment of a 16-year-old girl, close quotes, the girl being called Rose, and that, quotes, by so doing, close quotes, the claimant was a serial abuser who had acted hypocritically, recklessly, irresponsibly and obscenely. Mr Justice Nicklin held that those meanings were defamatory at common law. Mr Sivia pleaded three defences, truth, honest opinion and publication on matter of public interest. All three were struck out summarily by Mrs Justice Collins Rice as disclosing no reasonable basis for defending the claim. Permission to appeal against the striking out of the defences of truth and honest opinion was refused but an appeal against the dismissal of the public interest defence was heard and was allowed. The result was that when the case came on for trial before Mrs Justice Stain, who I shall call the judge, in July 2022, there were only two issues on liability. These were whether Miss Riley had shown that the publication complained of had caused or was likely to cause, quote, serious harm, close quotes, to her reputation, within the meaning of Section 1 of the Defamation Act 2013, and if so, whether Mr Sivia had established a defence of publication on matter of public interest under Section 4 of the 2013 Act. <clears throat> In a judgment handed down on the 16th of November 2022, uh, the judge found for Miss Riley on the issue of serious harm, rejected the defence of public interest and awarded damages of £50,000. On the 23rd of November 2022, she ordered Mr Sibia to pay Miss Riley's costs to be assessed and to make a payment of a, on account of £100,000 uh, within 28 days. Mr Sibia does not challenge the judge's conclusion on serious harm or her assessment of damages. He wishes to appeal against the judge's rejection of his public interest defence and, of course, her consequent finding that he was liable. To pursue such an appeal, Mr Sibia needs permission to get permission, he needs to show that an appeal would have a real prospect of success. Sometimes there may be a compelling reason for the court to hear an appeal that's not shown to stand a chance of succeeding, but Mr Sivia does not suggest that this is such a case. Uh, nor do I consider that it is. The normal procedure in the Court of Appeal is for a single judge to decide whether permission should be granted, and to do so after reading the papers and without a hearing, but the judge can direct a hearing of the application. In this case, that's what I did, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, I know the case has attracted a fair amount of publicity, uh, and I thought it appropriate for this stage to be conducted in public, in court. Another reason for a hearing was that before making a decision on whether the threshold for permission was crossed, I needed a better understanding of Mr Sivia's arguments uh, and those put forward on behalf of Miss Riley. I gave some directions to make sure that those arguments were explained in more detail, and in the meantime, I granted a stay of execution on the judge's orders for costs and damages until after judgment on this application. I've, uh, in the result, I've had some further submissions uh, and uh, some notes uh, of the relevant parts of the documents below, uh, and those have helped me understand better what the rival arguments are. Uh, I've spent time before this hearing considering those arguments, uh, and I've heard further oral argument at the hearing today. Uh, the issue for decision. To establish a public interest defence, a defendant needs to prove three things. One, that the public publication complained of was on a matter of public interest. Two, that the defendant believed that it was in the public interest to publish the statement complained of. And three, that his belief, this belief, was reasonable. The judge found in Mr Sivia's favour on each of the first two points but she held that his belief that it was in the public interest to publish what he did was not reasonable. The primary basis for that conclusion was that Mr Sivia had held and stuck with his belief without conducting, quotes, such inquiries and checks as it is reasonable to expect of him in all the circumstances, close quotes. See paragraph 162. One key failure, uh, according to the judge, was that Mr Sivia did not provide Miss Riley with any opportunity to comment before he published the article. The judge went on to identify a further and additional basis for her decision, at paragraph 163, 
This was that, quote, even leaving aside, close quotes, the flaws that she found in the process, Mr. Sibia's belief was, quote, manifestly unreasonable, close quotes. She held he had no reasonable grounds to believe that what he published was true. Mr. Sivia um, argues in summary that the reasoning behind these conclusions was unsound and in some respects incomplete and that it involved errors of law. He, he wants the Court of Appeal to reverse the judge's decision or to order a retrial and the issue at this stage is whether he has a real prospect of obtaining either of those outcomes. The grounds of appeal. There are three grounds of appeal. Ground one refers to section 4, subsection 2 of the 2013 Act. Uh, this requires a court deciding whether a defence under the section is made out to, quote, have regard to all the circumstances of the case, close quotes. The ground of appeal is that the judge failed to do this. Under that general heading, Mr. Sivia makes uh, at least eight separate complaints of different kinds about the judgment. Uh, some of these have subpoints. All are points of detail. Uh, many are complaints that the judge made mistaken findings of fact. Some are complaints that she did not mention aspects of the evidence. Uh, ground two uh, relates to section four, subsection four of the 2013 Act. That provides that in deciding whether a person's belief that publication is in the public interest is a reasonable one, the court must, quote, make such allowance for editorial judgment as it considers appropriate, close quotes. The judge set out that provision at her paragraph 126, and she discussed it at paragraph 131, where she set out the legal principles. But Mr. Sivia argues that she failed to consider editorial judgment at all when she came to assess the reasonableness of his belief. The third ground of appeal is that there was a, quote, serious procedural irregularity, close quotes, because to quote the skeleton argument, quote, it was procedurally irregular for the judge to reach her own conclusions as to the facts in order to undermine Dee's reasonable belief, close quotes. The complaint is about a passage in the judgment of 163 in which Mrs. Justice Stane said that she had, quote, no hesitation in agreeing with Mrs. Justice Collins Rice, uh, Rice's conclusion that the statement complained of was not only untrue, it was not even arguably true. The argument is that these observations that went, that these observations involved findings of fact that went beyond the scope of the issues before the judge. It infected the judge's conclusions on the section four defence and were moreover unfair to Mr. Sivia, who was not permitted to cross-examine Miss Riley on the issue. I have given careful consideration to each of these grounds of appeal and the arguments of counsel, for which I thank both of them. Uh, I have reached clear conclusions on each of them. The nature of the grounds of appeal, and in particular the nature of the challenges to the judge's findings of fact uh, under ground one, means that fairly detailed reasons will need to be given to explain my conclusions. Uh, I shall not give those reasons now. I shall give them in writing tomorrow morning um, in a judgment which will include uh, what I've already said, uh, but will go further. But at this stage, I can say that my overall conclusion is that for the reasons I will give in detail in writing, none of the three grounds of appeal is properly arguable with a real prospect of success. Uh, for those reasons, uh, permission to appeal is refused. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, Mr. Stables, I I'll hand down uh, a judgment um, tomorrow morning at 10.30. It'll be in draft, subject to corrections, uh, which I think is from what you said earlier, is how it was done by Mrs. Justice Stone. Uh, at any rate, that's how it's going to be done. Very well. um, so it means you won't see it until it's handed down, but when you do see it, the usual process of submitting a list of typographical and other obvious errors uh, will apply, and unless either of you want more time, I would allow 48 hours for that, so some, until sometime on Friday morning, at which point the, the judgment will be perfected. The, uh, I don't think there's anything that needs to be said about the stay, because that lasts uh, until after judgment. I, I would take that to mean um, until tomorrow. Uh, 
because I've given my decision but not my judgment of the reasons. So the stay doesn't expire until the judgment has been handed down. Is there anything else? Thank you, Thank you very much. Well done.